strap your belt on, kid. We're going in. Disney certainly wanted the rights Paramount, a couple of other studios. Uh, and I think they did most of the negotiation with Nintendo up in California. Um, and we started off doing that, but I very quickly realized that the way to do it was to actually go to, to Kyoto, uh, which is where the Nintendo headquarters were in Japan. And basically I got on a plane and I met the boss of Nintendo, who's a very intriguing man, and, but it was rather like going to meet the Japanese emperor. He asked me what the story was. So I told him the story, as we envisaged it at the time, and said, of course, this might change, but we talked about the kind of the, the dinosaur world and et cetera, et cetera. 65 million years ago, when this meteorite hit the Earth, that maybe a small group of dinosaurs weren't wiped out, but they were shifted into a sub-dimension by some sonic wave created by this meteor. He listened to this, and he really liked the story. And then he said, but why would I give it to you when there are all these major studios doing it? And I said, well, I don't have an answer for that. It would be a whim, it would be a speculation. And because I'm here and they aren't. And he really liked that, he clapped his hands at that and said, Vera, that's a very good point. And then he suggested a price and I said, well, you know, it was just one company, it was Jake, Ebbets and I were in this together. And I thought that that was rather high. So he said, well, suggest a price. So I kind of cut it down by half. And he laughed uproariously and said I was cheeky. Um, but then said, go ahead, you should do it. Uh, I think much to Disney and Paramount and the others' frustration. <laughs> No, he is. I'm just apprenticing. Get in the car. But I didn't do Get nothing. In the car. Are you telling us that you're going to arrest a guy for being a plumber? I don't know if you've played Super Mario Brothers. There's no story. There's nothing. I mean, there's side scrolling action and bouncing. There was a draft initially that Barry Morrow had done um, that was radically, like, it wasn't even in a it was almost no fantasy element at all. It was an existential road trip, sort of like Rain Man. And there was even a joke that it was so, so much like Rain Man, they called it Drain Man uh, in the office. And, uh, and then they uh, threw that out and they hired um, Jim Genoan and Tom Parker, who had, uh, um, I'm not sure of all their credits, but they, you know, they went on to write The Flintstones and a whole bunch of like early 90s comedy movies, Richie Rich and stuff like that. And they realized that it was a movie that would be great for six-year-olds. Looking around for directors was a very interesting search, really, because we wanted people with a very different view. We wanted something kind of exciting. Um, we wanted something ahead of its time, which is, I think, what we got. And at that time, I was kind of casting around, and I suddenly realized that there was a, a, a show on television called Max Headroom. Max Headroom was uh, a film that turned into a TV series that we made for Channel 4 in England before we made Super Mario Brothers. It had a wonderful sort of talking head, and at th those stages, a special effect head that talked, that was a centerpiece of a show, that was quite way out. It was an incredibly long process of um, experimenting with sp specific techniques to try and create what Max Hedrum was, there was no computer generated characters in those days. And it was such a big success here in America that it brought us to Hollywood and then we were offered DOA with Dennis Quaid and Meg Ryan which became our first proper feature film, although Max Hedrum was a film but it was made for television and then, uh, and then we were looking for our next film after DOA and the script came through and it said Super Mario Brothers on it. When Super Mario Brothers came up as, an, as, a, as a potential, as, an os, as a possibility to direct, um, it was in the same, part of the same arena, you know, the kind of pop cultural arena, and therefore it was, it was a very attractive proposition. And I thought, oh, this could be incredible, making a film of a video game, because it would never been done before. One of the lovely things about working with Nintendo, they basically said, look, we, we but well, what they basically said is we're not really interested in the film. Um, you know, we have our game players and this is a sort of addendum and you should do what you want. I just read the title, I thought, oh, this is fantastic. And then I read the script and I was really disappointed. It was a very charming, childlike story going through an almost an animated fantasy type of film. And, and I thought, well, this isn't the, f you know, I don't want to make a film like this. I wanted to stretch the kids. I wanted, I wanted to make a film for the whole family where the, when they left the cinema, the, the parents would have to explain 
the story a bit because it might, might have been a bit too adult for them. Not, not to make it an adult film, but for the whole family. I remember Roland Joffe approaching us and it was um, a bit of a long-winded sort of wild goose chase actually, kind of chasing him around the world trying to have a meeting, um, which ultimately culminated in a meeting in Rome. I happened to be in Rome setting something up, I think, and I remember sitting in the hotel and Rocky and Annabelle came sitting kind of side by side on the sofa, like a pair of twins really, and they began to explain their take. I came up with an idea of the real story of Super Mario Brothers, if you like, the real story of two, two plumbers from Brooklyn and what really happened to them. And then I came up with the idea that perhaps uh, the dinosaurs existed in a parallel universe. The dinosaurs continued to evolve in, on their evolutionary path whilst the mammals continued to populate the Earth as we know it and continue on their evolutionary path. But of course, you know, in the underworld was King Cooper with his dinosaur race feeling well left out. I didn't want to make a literal interpretation. I wanted to open up a discussion about the origin of these two plumbers from Brooklyn, how the story could have come about. There's something so basically real about being a plumber, which is what I liked about the game, what I thought was just fun about the game. It's very easy to um, empathise in a way with a plumber, particularly a plumber and his assistant in Brooklyn or wherever they were. What are you doing? I don't know, Mario. Just trust me. I got a good feeling about this alley, but I don't know. What? The thing that we that, that was very attractive, that I loved, was the story of the brothers, and that was why Ian Lafrenier and Dick Clements came on board because of their brilliant um, relationship work that they'd done with, um, with male characters. The original script that we came up with was quite adult. It was more akin to a film such as the original Batman. Um, it had a dark edge to it, and it was a relationship film between two uh, plumbers, pitting the two of them together and uh, resolving at the end the, 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 the crisis between them. And I deliberately uh, decided just to use the game as an influence. Saw it more like the film was the prequel to the video game. The video game came after as a result of, you know, here's the graphic interpretation of, of a reality that kind of existed in a parallel dimension. I went and pitched the story to the studio and they loved it. They definitely had a strange take on everything and I thought this was a very interesting mix. A very different kind of style to the filmmaking I was doing at the time and I thought that was very healthy. I had a talk with Jake Eberts who was my partner in the project and Jake was a wonderfully kind of imaginative man and he's sadly missed really. I mean, he died recently but uh, he kind of loved the idea or two, uh, as well. I mean, Jake loved an adventure, so the idea that we were going to go with some very raw and very new talent, um, I think he found very exciting. What happened was that the producers uh, were getting reactions from the studios that this film was a bit too dark, and if you're going to make a film of Super Mario Brothers, it has to be a kid's film. And then other writers were brought in. Then it went to Parker and, and Terry, very funny guys. Terry Ronte was my writing partner. He and I had met in college. We started a humor magazine, and after that we started writing for National Lampoon and Playboy and some other magazines. Always wanted to get into movie writing. And so when we heard about that, we said, yeah, we gotta, we gotta go meet with these guys. And we sat down and they told us about their idea for Super Mario Brothers, and we were like, yeah, <laughs> that is an awesome idea. I don't think we ever talked about what we'd actually do with the movie in this meeting. So we had made a, um, little like pitch for the like, well, well, here's what we would do. We sent it off to them and I'd drawn a little um, cover to the thing that was a, the movie poster and it was a maze of pipes that like went into the dark, deep dark depths and there was a maze of pipes and bright red eyes at the bottom and it was, you know, I don't remember what the tag line even was now, but it was, you know, that that kind of got them on board with like, you know, we can work with these guys. For six weeks, we sat in a room with Rocky and Annabelle and we filled a wall with ideas. And we mapped out something which was seemed much lighter but still had the kind of um, somewhat dystopian vision and came up with a script that we were very, very happy with, thrilled with in fact, and felt as though we were really, you know, kind of charging along at full speed. The problem was that the producers had already spent 
probably five or six million dollars, maybe more, <laughs> at this point. And they were panicking. They were trying to, you know, they were trying to make this for under twenty million dollars. So we had the producers on, you know, on the one hand, bringing us aside and going, you know what? If more of this took place in the real world, that would really help our budget. <laughs> you know, we, that would help us a lot. So we got pulled in kind of two directions, um, and. I had also kind of taken it upon myself. Um, they bought us a Nintendo system, um, and I got totally sucked in and spent a lot of time uh, playing Super Mario Brothers 2. And uh, I'd really like said, you know what? The people who love this property, you know, they have certain expectations. We can't not reference the game. We have to have, you know, even if they're funny and subverse, subversive, you know, if we subvert the references and they're just more like a wink and a nod. You know, I was I was thinking we've got to do more. We got to have you know the boots. We got to have the you know. Anytime we had a way to work something in from the game, I was the one trying to lead that charge. And in fact, I was drawing up you know here's here's how the coin boxes will work over the telephone. Like you know, it, it takes Koopa coins and there's a thing that sucks it up and you know and then when it gives you a change, it bursts out of the top like the game. And so I was coming up with things to like how would the game work in this weird parallel world. Uh, we turned in the first draft and the producer, who's a sweet guy, Fred Caruso, um, he came in and as nicely as humanly possible said, um, uh, <clears throat> theoretically, how quick could you pack up everything and get out of this office? <laughs> so we were done. No wonder they tell you never to come up here. Mario, I got a feeling. I got a feeling we're not in Brooklyn no more. Where are you going? Hey. This was a, an independent production, so it wasn't that we could kind of sail in and offer tens of millions of dollars. We had to have a realistic price. So someone like Bob Hoskins was, in a way, perfect. Uh, Danny DeVito was, 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 it was going to be originally, and then it became Bob. You know, he was available. And I thought he was a perfect Mario. Absolutely love Bob Hoskins uh, as Mario. Here I go. I'll do this. Go check for messages. See if we got any work. All right, all right. He has such an earthy quality, you know, there's something so grounded. And frankly, I think he looks like Super Mario. I mean, there's something very round about Bob. I play Mario Mario. The, uh, well, as I've seen, that little guy that bounces up and down in, in the game. In him, there's a sort of passion. I mean, Bob is like a very passionate man. He's like a very big man locked up in a rather small one. He's great fun, I mean, and very inventive. He just was Super Mario. I used to do Shakespeare and wear tights, you know, but now I'm playing this little character that bounces up and down, and down in, a, in a game. You should be talking to the Milto in a shower next. Well, Mario, don't you see? It's been trying to help us all along. You needed very much to find a legitimate way to have a Mario brother, or the Mario brothers um, as, a, as a twosome that weren't literally brothers. We wanted a Luigi that was in contrast to Mario, you know, a, a completely different type of actor. And we cast around and we, we finally found John Leguizamo, who's a genius improv stand-up comic actor, you know, really super bright guy. And I remember going to see him at, I think, Second City in Chicago for one night only, seeing him, meeting him, knowing that he was, it, you know, just would be great. We sat down and... They had just seen my, my show, Spicorama, and they, they wanted me to bring what I had in that show to, to Super Mario Brothers. I didn't know how that would fit, but, you know, they were like, you know, we want you to come there and improvise, and we're going to create a whole new character, and we want to bring your vibe and your feistiness, and, and I was sold. Luigi Mario, what, you got a problem with that? You know, he's instantly likable, and there's a kind of, what he could project is a kind of innocence. I mean, I don't think John's innocent at all, really, but, but he could project that. I overheard the name was Daisy. Yes, you know, I haven't heard that name around here. It's really nice, too. It's a, no, I have heard it because it's like the flower and everything. But it, not that like I hang around the flower shops and nothing like that. I was just like trying to make the best choices I could, you know. And being a, you know, a Latin man in, in that time in the 90s was, you know, wasn't easy, you know. It wasn't easy to, to for opportunities and, 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 and big roles like that. So this was a huge, huge thing. Daisy! Is that you? I, I never knew or heard of John before, and everybody's, oh, John, John, John Lucas Hamo. He's this amazing actor, John Lucas Hamo, John Lucas Hamo. I thought he'd be like, everybody's talking about him, like, he's a little guy. 
I tell you, he, 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 he's not that good of a basketball player. And then you added Fisher Stevens and Richie Edson, who are hilarious, you know. And, and Rich, Richie, he was, he was a little confused because he was used to being himself. And now he was this creature and character. And so he just followed, you know, Fisher's lead. And the two of them became friends. I don't know, but it's not good. But, uh, you know, it's Fisher, so I was like, okay, he's my partner, so I gotta be on top of this. I'm Iggy. I'm Spike. Uh, yeah. I'm Spike. I'm Spike. He's Iggy. I'm Spike. I, I've been in situations where actors, uh, kind of, if you're not, not as strong as they are, they'll just like, try to take, take over scenes. And so I was, I've learned my lesson with that stuff. And as much as I like Fisher, I was like, oh, okay, th this is a professional situation too, so I have to take care of myself. Hello. I captured the princess. <gasps> She's being defungused. Well, then we were looking for a bad guy. I play King Koopa, the Lizard King. Dennis just seemed the, the perfect in a way, cliched bad guy, if you like. That Koopa clown yeah. is one evil, egg-sucking son of a snake. And because the film, in many ways, is a cartoon, it, it, he seemed the right fit because of his legacy. In the way he really took his character seriously and he was going to really create this dinosaur and he started, he was trying to walk like a T-Rex, so his head's... And they told him not to do so much of that. Man, I'm gonna do this. Man, I'm a, I'm a T-Rex and I got little hands. <laughs> and you know, look at the tail and, and he would like walk around like that all the time. Tyrannosaurus Rex, the Lizard King, thank you very much. Goomba. You know, I certainly knew the video game. I didn't quite comprehend how they would take the video game and make a narrative out of it. And, uh, which is a first instinct, which is sometimes a good instinct <laughs> to think about. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, when I saw the people who were attached to the project, uh, I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. My agent called me and said they had taken a pass on me because they were afraid uh, that the film would look too much like uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure and Blade Runner. So they hired uh, someone else uh, I believe his name was Wolf Kroger. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I got a call from Fred Caruso and said that Wolf Kroger has left the picture. Uh, my agent called me and said uh, that you've got the job. And Fred Caruso said to me, yeah, you got the job because they said that you were the guy that did Pee-wee's Big Adventure and Blade Runner. New York is a very big city but I wanted to build it as a set so I could light it. And we looked for somewhere big enough to build this thing. None of the studios in Hollywood were big enough. And we would go location scouting all over the United States. And then we found the cement plant uh, outside of Wilmington, North Carolina. In search of their dream location, the filmmakers stumbled upon an abandoned cement factory. This mammoth five-story structure reinforced the production team's motto, creativity is transforming what is into what might be. I thought that the volume of the space afforded me the opportunity to do something of, of you know, monumental scale. I walked into, you know, one of the great kind of rooms where I think they mixed the powders or whatever it was that make the concrete up. And the thing must have been 350 feet long and was about 90 feet high. And it was vast. It was five stories high, which was just about big enough to build New York as an interior. And I, I thought it was a good spot, aside from the fact that it, it was probably toxic. There was still so much cement dust on the walls and everybody was inhaling it, so people started wearing masks. So we were in this giant factory that they turned into the city, you know, which was pretty incredible to turn the factory into a whole underground sub subterranean world. David Snyder, the production designer, he kind of like wrangled everybody, so he brought in this kind of team. And how it would work is he would meet with Rocky and Annabelle and then come to us and we would, he would then just kind of talk about what they wanted to do with specific sets in the show. And because uh, the structure, the concrete and steel structure, was already in place, what I thought I could do was I could take all those 
columns and beams and then put the sets inside them. And so basically the sets were like curtain wall sets, meaning that the, the, the amount of money that you spend on sets is usually in the structure to just hold them up. And that was already in place. And I said, well, this, this is a great situation. Once we found the main street, and we knew we could build our main street, then everything just kind of, that was it, and everything just kind of followed suit after that. I knew we had to build the set in that environment, so there was no sense of designing it from scratch and then trying to fit it, as opposed to the other way around. So it really just kind of, I knew kind of what, what I wanted to do, but I had to find a way to fit it within that environment. And that's where a lot of the things kind of came from, is because of that environment. When we did uh, Koopa's apartment, with the mud bath and his apartment and the, the wax machine and all that, you're literally 100 feet in the air. That's not a composite shot or a mat shot. We literally built the set like 100 feet up so that when you look down at the street, that's not a trick shot, that's, that's real. And I'll finally be able to merge our world with theirs. You know, it kind of sounds a little ethereal, but being in the space and figuring out, oh, I can do this here. That's where like the big mud bath came in. There was, a, there was like two floors and a huge opening and that's why I thought that'd be perfect. The stairs could come down. We'd do the mud bath here, and you know what I mean? So that's when then it starts to go into your head and you start to draw based on that environment. I had about 10 or 15 people in the art department and then set decorating had even more. We had sculptors, plasterers, painters. I mean, it, it was a, a, gigantic, a gigantic thing to do outside of Hollywood at the time. I would then kind of go and just start designing the sets and then Patrick, he would do the creatures, and then Simon, he would then do the, the vehicles and the props. I started very much as a concept artist on the project. Uh, got involved in the main street design and things like this, a lot of the aspect of general view of the world, and quickly got caught up into starting playing with the creatures. They thought I would be good at doing this. He would say, David, I don't want to do creatures anymore. I want to do architecture, no more creatures. And I said, no, that's what you have to do. So he did a great job. I, th I think the uh, Yoshi, is that the name of that dinosaur, Yoshi? He still had a very cute look to it, like the eyes were bigger than they should be, to its proportion to make him look a little cuter. But the basic proportion of the, of the animal were quite realistic. It was fun because we did know at the time that Jurassic Park was happening, was around the corner, and we knew the kind of like resource they would have to do something pretty insane. So it was good for us to not just go cartoon, but have one of our characters being a little bit more realistic. That's why Yoshi, contrary to the video game, became a more realistic uh, little character. That was, of, of course, driven by Rocky and Abel and probably Roland Joffe as well. To see, to see that in action at that time, considering the technology, I I thought it was an incredible job. We knew Yoshi also was a full-on creature. He was a full-on puppet. There was nobody wearing a suit for him, contrary to the Goombas. So he had to be an incredibly high-end, high-tech animatronic puppet. I was very proud of that. Throwback. Once, once my task became Patrick's designing the creatures, um, you know, I had to tackle on all of them. Now, the execution was done by different group, like I said, but my job was to bring drawing approved by the director to those different companies and say, hey, this is kind of where we're going with this. So Makeup Effect Labs had hired me and basically became my sponsor to become an American citizen and work in America. They, I owe them a lot and I love those guys. So at the time I decided, you know, I gotta make sure they work on this project and I just called them and I say, hey, I got to design creature for this project and I'm mentioning you to the studio, you guys should get involved in this. That's how they started to work with uh, the Goombas, which was basically what they ended up doing and a couple of extra creature things. It was a very exciting time here at the shop. You know, we had a lot of uh, talented people here doing, uh, creating basically the Goombas. Which is a little buddy back here and there was several of those, I think there was six to eight of them. So each Goomba had an individual puppeteer that uh, worked all the facial expressions on it. They were only supposed to be a small part of the film and by the time they got shooting, they liked it so much, they just kept putting them in places all over. Patrick Tatopoulos basically was heading up everything. He was doing the designs and he kind of delegated his designs to certain shops uh, around in Los Angeles. What I was actually hired to do was to help with the Boom Boom Bar and then all of a sudden they said, you know, and then I got more, I even got more, uh, um, you know, on my list, like, 
oh, well, Mel's doing the Goombas, but we haven't figured out how they're going to melt or explode. They were all looking for another effect shop because all the other effect shops had taken all the other effects and they were doing Yoshi and the Goombas and all that other stuff, you know. And uh, so they're looking for somebody to kill King Goopa. From the time they shoot Dennis Hopper, we did a prosthetic that made Dennis Hopper have a big smile on his face, a big, uh, you know, T-Rex kind of grin. Uh, then we did a couple of the transformation heads that come out of that, and then they morphed in between all of those and until he finally became a pile of goo and spilled over the side. It's rare today, in the last 10 or 15 years even, when you have like three or four companies working on a project like this. Usually you have one group, like it's a Stan Winston thing, it's a, you know, ADI thing or whatever, but it's rare to have a chance to have a different group. And I think having a different group like that gave us a chance to have different flavor, which I thought was great. It was a studio, it was a community, it was a family. Super Mario Brothers was a, uh, a creature shop, a CGI place, a visual effects headquarters. Um, everybody had their, their key rooms and, 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 and were assigned things in this abandoned cement factory. We basically had all our own shops and our own workspaces to do what we had to do on the movie. The teams that were doing all that, we were so busy with the architecture and the sets that we barely had time to speak together. So the fact that it all turned out and it married well, was pure luck. Mm -hmm. It just happened because of the skills of all the people involved and the nature of it all. I don't know, we all got to North Carolina and it became a much bigger uh, obstacle. The whole script became a big obstacle. We were really, you know, kind of charging along at full speed. Everything was going gangbusters. And then all of a sudden, um, a new writer was brought on board, Ed Solomon, who'd written Bill and Ted's, uh, ostensibly as far as we understood it, to make it more, possibly more family friendly. The script came in 10 days before the first day of principal photography was when this entirely new script came in. I mean, Rocky and Abel were really unhappy with what the studio was asking for, how they were trying to dumb things down. And they, pro they were, and they were trying to fight against that trying to give us our freedom. Annabelle and I were forbidden to, uh, to talk to the scriptwriter because there was a time crunch and they didn't want the scriptwriter to be interfered with, if you like, by the, direct, the, by the directors and uh, wanted him just to concentrate on rewriting the script the way they wanted it, which was you know, more uh, for a younger audience. Obviously the writing process was going on and on and on and on prior to my involvement in the picture. And it continued to go on and on and on and on during the uh, production of the picture. You know, it's a hard juggling act because I mean, you keep changing things every day. And this is not unusual in high stakes filmmaking. People do it because they think, oh my God, we left out this whole plot beat or gee, wouldn't it be great if? I always storyboard everything. I don't necessarily shoot the storyboard, but I storyboard everything in meticulous detail. And on Super Mario Brothers, I'd storyboarded the entire film to absolute minute detail to the original script. And <clears throat> I had a chart of all the actors and the costumes and all the props that were in every single set. And when the, the new script came in, 10 days before principal photography, it literally had no relevance to my meticulous storyboard. And I can remember ritually burning in the parking lot, my entire storyboard, because the storyboards were pinned up on these mobile um, um, big display units on wheels, so I could wheel them onto the set, because I wanted every single person to be uh, involved in the complexity of what we were doing, so they could see the storyboard and they could see their character and how it evolved and, and what was happening, and there was no time to re-storyboard. So we were just doing it on the fly. And I remember uh, one, one executive uh, said, Mark, I won't beat around the bush. I think we're in trouble. This was day one. We had to retrofit this brand new script within 10 days um, into the, the sets that had already been built and the props that had been made and everything. The pressure was enormous. 
It was an incredibly complex production. There was the main unit, there was a second unit, pickup unit, green screen, special effects, visual effects unit. Um, and it was essentially guerrilla filmmaking. It was almost like documentary style filmmaking, but with very heavy duty equipment. It created all sorts of frustrations with, with us, with the actors, with the, uh, you know, with the DP even. I mean, I can remember shooting on a set and the paint wasn't dry, it hadn't even been built. About halfway through the movie, maybe a little earlier than that, we all started to know that, uh-oh, uh-oh. You know, it was that moment of, we all look at each other going, oh shoot, is this that, we're on the Titanic, aren't we? Pretty soon we began to run out of money. And then the producers managed to get a major studio to kick in the, the, the final amount of finance. Terry and I decided <laughs> um, that we would, hey, let's go check it out. You know, let's go down and hang out on the set. And you know, it's always fun to hang out on the set. And uh, showed up and immediately were taken aside by Roland Joffe and going, oh, I'm so glad you're here. We just happen to need a couple of writers. <laughs> and we said, all right, sure, yeah. And, and so um, at that point, the movie was having trouble. The floodgates had opened. We were making this film. The, the fact that the script didn't really relate to a lot of the sets and the props and, and, and everything, we just had to deal with it on a daily basis on the set, which was frustrating for the actors because I can remember, you know, directing one of the actors having the piece of the meteorite and reacting to the piece of the meteorite. And my continuity girl came up to me and said, well, hang on a minute, she can't have the piece of meteorite because it doesn't make sense in the story because you know in page 56 it, it, it's here and it, and it can't possibly be there and it was a flaw in the script because it had been written so fast. But our only instruction was cut. Our only instruction was make less things to film and so we couldn't do that in good faith without being in service of the story and saying well if we cut that, then this, you know, this has to fill in. And we, we tried to do our best to patch it together. We failed. Uh, we just, you know, we did the best we could. If you think of the Mario brothers as plumbers who are constantly dealing with leaky pipes, uh, yeah, there's a leak over there, patch it. There's a leak over there, patch it. No, get, get the tub and get the water in it. You know, yeah, but, but then who's looking out for the whole thing? And the script just said they just get in the elevator. Um, and I'm there on the set and I'm thinking, well, how can we make this into, not, not only how do they do this, how do they cope with the scene, but how can we make this into a scene because it's going to be boring just going up in the elevator. And uh, there was nothing in the script to say what, what was going to happen. I asked the actors to leave and everybody to leave and I said that I was relighting the set. <clears throat> but I wasn't rewriting the set, I was rewriting the script. The idea was that Luigi, in his kind of naive, sort of artistic nature that we had established, he started to sway the Goombas to the music that was coming from the elevators. And in this swaying, it's a bit like snake charming. We know that, that um, you know, with, with, with primitive things like snakes and, and lizards, you can, you can hypnotize them, and that's what Luigi was doing, was hypnotizing them, was swaying them to the music and getting them to dance. And it became a story point in the end. <laughs> Bob would say to John Leguizamo, do, do you know what we're doing? And he'd say, no, I don't know what we're doing. And you could hear it over the radio mics, and the two of them, and so they would just, they would just do business. <laughs> I'm gonna jump. Come on, cause somebody's gotta do it. We don't got no other choice, right? Luigi. Yeah, it was tricky to try to add real behavior to these characters. We were trying, we were all trying, you know. And we uh, did a lot of work shortening things and then that's why uh, Dennis Hopper uh, wound up hollering at us for half an hour and uh, making us look up the word act in the dictionary. Uh, because we had, you know, if, if he's taken the time to commit something to memory, you don't change it. <laughs> the script pages came out in the morning and Dennis Hopper threw them in the trash can because he knew that by the time he got to set, everything was rewritten again. He was furious. He came on a set. And he was furious. And he started ranting and raving. I mean, literally just ranting and raving and he out of his mind about how unprofessional this was. He never worked in such an unprofessional environment. This is an embarrassment that 
Rocky and Annabelle are embarrassment to the film industry. I mean, he's just going on. Well, I'm like, my mouth is like, are you kidding me? And there's like 300 extras waiting and, uh, you know, and Rocky out there were just begging him to tell them what he wanted them to do because they would do everything. And they offered it, so you write the scene, we'll go back to the original scene, whatever you want to do. And it's like, well, you write it. He said, I'm not a writer, I'm an actor. You know, so finally, I don't know, he, he kind of like burnt all the uh, anger out. And, and I said, all right, Dennis, what, what do you want to do? I said, I'll do it the way it's written. And Fish and I, like, I mean, we were looking at each other, we were just, we had to like pinch ourselves from, from not cracking up. And ready the troops. We're going down. I'm sure that if you speak to the actors, um, uh, they will uh, recall all sorts of problems on the set and with the script and, and with the filmmaking in general. Uh, we did have a lot of problems, it's true. There were so many captains on this ship, you know, you had Annabelle and Rocky, which are two different people, so they have different opinions of each other for for everything. Then you had Jake Eberts, then you had Disney, you had Jeffrey, uh, Roland J Jaffe. And, I mean, you had a lot of people. So I, I mean, as actors, we get confused a lot. You know, you, get, you would get a lot of different messages. I would get messages like, don't be so funny. Oh, can you be funny? How about funny in this scene? How about not so funny in this scene? How about a little, and it was like, oh. And they, and they was, you know, Rocky and Bell, I loved them, man. They gave me a huge opportunity. This was, I mean, a Latin guy in the lead in the early 90s. That was, that was very brave of them. And, uh, and they convinced the studio to take me on, which was huge. Where's Daisy? Oh, no, no, no. Where's the rock, scallywag? Where's Daisy, butt breath? So before I do it, they're setting up the new scene, and I go to Rocky and Animal. Fisher may dispute who went over there, but... Uh, I have a videotape of it, so if he, again, if he wants to sue me, uh, you know, he's going to lose, and you can tell him that. Um, you know, save him a lot of expense and time, and then a countersuit, and, uh, it'll be messy, it'll be really messy. But, um, where was I? Oh, yeah, so I walked over to Rocky yeah, I said, look, you know, we don't want to be presumptuous, but we wrote our own scene, and I, I think it's a, probably funnier, and more interesting, and they were like, oh, oh, you did. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I, you know, let's do your scene, and then, you know, do ours, and you can you pick the one. And I look at the sky, and I'm like, oh, they better get this. So anyway, we did the first scene, we did one or two, th th two or three times, and they were happy with it, and the sky's getting light, and light, light. Let Rocky, let Animal, let's, can we do the other one? And they were like, Okay, 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 you could, you could do it. So we did it, and they loved it. And we're like, ah, oh, at least we can be creative, at least we can have a little fun. And, but, you know, the, the only great thing about that was that we all really got close as actors. We spent a lot more time together because it, so, it was becoming so difficult that the rest of us banded together. Just, you know, how obstacles and, and pain just bring people together. So we were started spending a lot of time hanging out, playing basketball all, all the time, going to par partying, and we just had an amazing time. <laughs> Bob, he was a beautiful human being. He was just so embracing, you know, very nurturing, protective of all of us and himself, and just a really kind man, you know, and, uh, and talented, incredibly talented. I mean, he would take these scenes that were kind of ridiculous, <laughs> And just infuse him with all this passion and, and energy and feistiness, you know. It, it, it was just you would watch him and go, how is he doing? How is he taking this this bland line that it just is so hard to add any personality to and making it come to life? And he would with that, that voice that he would put to it. Come on, Luigi. Come on, you're going to see it tonight. You impress him with your manners. He was fantastic. You know, I know he's, he's be, you know, he's been kind of harsh. Uh, over the years in the press um, and I know that he said that he uh, you know that it was the worst thing he ever did I seem to remember him saying um, but you know call me oblivious but he was incredibly professional and wonderfully um, helpful actually if I could just take a moment here because today 
I it's a sad day in relation to uh, Super Mario Brothers. I guess uh, Bob Hoskins, who was Mario, uh, died um, yesterday. And uh, he's a great guy. So Bob Hoskins was not a big fan of his role in the 1993's Super Mario Brothers. Playing the title role was one of his biggest regrets. He told UK is the Guardian. He listed it as his worst job and biggest disappointment. He said it was the one role <laughs> shouldn't laugh. He said it was a one role he would edit from his past if he could. So uh, Bob Hoskins, I hope it wasn't that bad and may you rest in peace. We were still pushing forward. I mean everybody was on the movie had, was a force of nature to contend with. I mean Bob kept pushing through. You know I, I broke his hand in the movie which was, you know, it was always things going on. I mean, I was, my scene with him, the poor man, he would ask me to go, we would go in his trailer, we have a little libation, you know, but he, he called it a mild sensation because he always did the Cockney rhyming slang. So it, it was just a mild sensation, and I was supposed to drive the big Super Mario Brothers van. And I'm not a really great stunt driver, but I, I wanted to show off for Bob, and Bob is standing there, and I stepped, and it was manual, and I stepped really hard on the, on the accelerator, then put in the first and second, and I don't know, and the door wasn't locked, so it, it was one of those sliding truck doors, and it came flying out onto Bob's hand, and just, and he was like running out there, oh, blow me, Mickey's, Jerry's bring his broken coke, you know, and then I broke his hand. Good catch, huh, Mario? I should try out for the Yankees. I'd high five you, but then you'd be an only child. Your father. The fungus. This is my father? Yes. I was on my way to Australia to make a movie for the same producer. And he said, Lance, we're, do we're doing Super Mario Brothers. And we talk about uh, a character called the Fungus King, but nobody ever saw him. So would you go and shoot for a day for me as a favor? I mean, I and, and I said, well, he has just given me this major role. And, and I said, absolutely. Absolutely, I'm there, and I realized this is a this is a character who's been suspended animation in Fungus World, whatever the hell that is. But anyway, and he wakes up on a throne, and now you see him. And I said well, to the director, "Get me some Rice Krispies, will you? You know, a box of Rice Krispies, because when I come out of this, when when they CG a big blob of fungus coming down and it and it morphs into me." I've been in there a long time, and I think I think I have some fungus in the lungs. So I had a handful of Rice Krispies, and when I come out, I went <laughs> and, and, it, and it sprayed all over the place. And the best part about that whole thing was I I'm looking down, and I see this woman in, in a summer dress with the most beautiful legs I'd ever seen. I mean, she was beautiful, and I I went to the makeup girl, who is that? Anyway, about a year and a half later, I married her, so. <laughs> Mario Brothers spawned life. <laughs> I'm back. Love those plumbers. There were a lot of opinions, you know, there were a lot of opinions from the producers, there were a lot of opinions from the actors, and there were a lot of opinions from the studio that were putting in the rest of the finance, and they wanted a certain kind of film which was going to appeal to younger people. So rather than fighting them, we decided to embrace that and tried to do the best we could. You know, a lot of it was throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping it would stick, but, but you know, it was a kind of, um, it, it was a daily challenge getting through, getting through this, you know, huge workload. You know, they did the best they could. And they did work very hard. Everyone was committed. Everyone was very committed. Five people, after Rocky and Annabelle, went home. Roland Joffe took us in. He said, okay, David, you're going to New York. Uh, Dean, you're doing this. Jimmy Davis, you're doing uh, the stunt unit. Chris Woods, you're doing the visual effects with Bob. So they weren't even there when the film was finished, you know. 
They, they said, you can go home now. It was all very nice, very friendly. And then we went about trying every way we could to finish the movie. Roland Joffe took over and he started directing. And Dean Simler, the DP, was one of the great DPs of our time. He took over second unit and started directing us in second unit stuff because it was so much stuff that was, we were falling behind so far. It's so much, so many details, so much uh, inserts were missing, you know, and it's also not his forte either, you know. This was, you know, fantasy video game. It wasn't, you know, he's used to doing real, real deep movies with like, you know, intense acting. This was, it was really, it was, it was not easy thing to do. I mean, this is a really hard thing to do. And the things that we did were just patch ups. I don't believe that, you know, they were of much consequence at the end of the day, just filler. The entire opening sequence um, hadn't even been written as a part of the script, it just one day appeared. We wound up getting hired again, uh, like six months later, because they had done a screening and the audience still wasn't quite like tracking the whole like parallel world, dinosaur, I don't get it. And that led to the infamous prologue uh, request, which we thought was a bad idea. And we thought, well, all right, if you make an animated thing that's like in the style of Super Mario Brothers and then have it turn into this dark thing, that could maybe help set the tone. It could just flat out say, here's what the story, you know, it'll get rid of all of this ambiguity about the, you know, people don't get it. Then something happened. A giant meteorite struck the earth. Goodbye, dinosaurs. When it came out, it was absolutely, you know, slated. You know, I'm responsible for it, for the film, and it's clearly flawed in a lot of ways, especially in the tone, and especially in the story that doesn't really make an awful lot of sense, but then the game doesn't make a lot of sense either. And um, it was a disappointment in the fact that I know what that film could have been. And that was the film that excited everybody. That was what excited the investors initially and excited the producers initially to embark on the project to make this film that we, that, that was our creation, Annabelle and mine, our creation together. But it de-evolved, a bit like the evolution chamber in the movie. It de-evolved in, in, into a whole different entity. The film was received really um, negatively. Sadly, um, but none surprisingly, because it was n not in any particular um, easily categorized area. But I think it was reviled um, quite vehemently by the big fans of the Super Mario Brothers games that, who felt, you know, possibly that we, we had done a great disservice to the, to the game. You have to put it in context of the era when it came out was there was a lot of um, discussion about video games and how it was affecting the youth of America and how kids were just spending all this time on playing video games and not doing their homework and the rest of it. And there were lots of articles and critics of it and they were trying to ban video games and blah, blah, blah. And I think it may have been Siskel or Ebert, so I forget which one of them, I think actually said, don't take your child to see this movie. And I'm not sure, quite sure why they did that. I think they were, they were, protective of something that didn't exist. I think they wanted to keep games out of cinema. Or I, I don't know what their particular crusade is. This is the magical thing about movie making, is that you enter a bubble of unreality, and you are in this, like Steve Jobs' reality distortion field, and you are completely deluded that, well, we can make this work. Like, uh, yeah, that part doesn't work, but you know, this other stuff is funny. And, and what happens is, there's bad movies all the time that do great. And you go, well, you know, Prince of Persia made a lot of money. <laughs> like, that's an awful movie, it made a lot of money. So you go, you never know. And while you're in it, you certainly don't know. When you're done and you're looking at it all together and you're going, man, you still go, maybe? <laughs> you know, it's, kids might like this. And in fact, there's a, a certain age range that saw this movie at the, you know, when they were 11 or nine or whatever, and, you know, it blew their minds and it was so weird and fun and bizarre and, you know, they didn't care, it doesn't make sense. And they're big, giant fans of the movie. How would I know that all of a sudden kids 
would mob me on the street. I remember they, they would come to me when people were rollerblades. All these kids would like chase me with rollerblades going, oh, you were Luigi Mario. And I was like, what the hell's going on? So weird. How did Mario, Mario. And they would recite lines from it. And I was going, there's no accounting for kids' taste, huh? That's great. I was so happy about that. And then now kids have grown up with it. You know, I get a lot of tweets from, from people. This was a part of my childhood. You were part of my childhood. It was so important to me. I love the movie, you know. So it's interesting how it's got this huge life after the fact. The uniqueness of this film seems to transcend good, bad, up, down, <laughs> parallel dimensions. I'm not sure, but there's a lot of stuff in it. Bit by bit, there's been a, you know, you know, there's, there's been a softening to it and a kind of a gradual, um, you know, accommodating in as much that we've had so many now movies that have been made from video games that I think um, it's actually okay now to like Super Mario Brothers. There's a lot of virtues to Super Mario Brothers. We've been talking about the hodgepodge nature of it, but now let's talk about what it really is also in a positive way. It's a very strange and unique experience. Not without its pleasures. I mean, there's a lot of pleasure with this stuff in it. You gotta go with it. So, you know, maybe it didn't fit into a cookie cutter pattern. It went its own way into a parallel universe where the laws of physics change. Let's put it that way. There is something enchanting about the fact that it has a cult following, actually quite a big cult following, um, because that means the film's giving people pleasure. And in the end, no matter what we do, it's about giving people a good time. And that good time can be all kinds of, in all kinds of ways. It can be sensually, it can be intellectually, it can be, can be emotionally. I mean, there are many ways in which people have a good time. But I think this movie created a kind of enchanted world that had one foot in fact and one foot in fantasy, and those things are rather lovely. As somebody once said, in order to achieve the sublime, you have to risk the ridiculous. And sometimes you get all of that, the sublime and the ridiculous in something. I'd rather see some risks being taken than retreads of the same old stuff. So, you know, Super Mario Brothers was an adventure in filmmaking for all of us. Kind of had a, kind of like a black cloud. Uh, <laughs> so all you people who love the movie, remember it was a black cloud for the people who uh, <laughs> took part, especially especially Rocky and Annabelle. I, I think they, they took the biggest hit. It was a harrowing experience for me. It was, it was, it, it, it was, uh, it was a tough experience. Trying to, ba it was a balancing act and trying to please everybody at the same time and still having a, a directorial point of view with the film. Well, I watched it this morning for the uh, first time in 20 years. You know, Funnily enough, I really enjoyed it and I found myself just smiling and feeling kind of warm and toasty inside despite the fact that it has had, it has had this, you know, terrible reputation and repercussions over the years, you know, with uh, how, it, how it was perceived and how, you know, as directors one is perceived. But I actually watched it and just thought, oh my God, there was that as well, and this idea, and that, and that, and there was that incredible thing, and there's the storyline, and then this enormous, enormous testicle comes down, which is the, the king that's been de-evolved into fungus, and, it, and it's so crazy and bonkers and, and, and sort of marvellous and, and wonderful that you've got to sort of like, you know, in a way, tip your hat to it and say, you know what, it was crazy. And I don't think there's any other, there's, an, there's not another film out there like it, put it that way. There's a little known uh, fact about my, my character. And um, that fact is that he, Spike, uh, became a superhero action figure. Hey, Dad, come on! <laughs> hey, trying to do an interview up here. There's a little known fact about Spike is that he joined an illustrious list of famous action heroes. Here's, here's one of them. This is Moses. But this 
Sigmund Freud. This is the first book, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Now you may, the, uh, the more, uh, the more uh, sharp people out there might be thinking, what is the connection between all these three? Well, they're action heroes, but they're also Jewish. And this is the final Jewish action hero, Albert Einstein, Jesus Christ, Sigmund Freud, and Moses. Now, to add to this pantheon of great Jewish uh, action heroes, super, superhero, is of course the beloved Spike, who was indeed Jewish. <laughs>